Well, welcome to today's daily service. I'm really glad that you've joined in. I'd like to open our service with some words from one of my favorite songs, words which speak about God's personal creation of you, God's intimate creation of me, God's specific, intentional creation of every human being that has been, is, or will be. Just listen to these incredible words as I read them for us. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. David says to God. Let's uh, pray to God together. Our Father, loving Creator, I thank you for the love that you have for every one of those listening right now. Thank you that they can say that you knit them together in their mother's womb. That it's not too much for them to say that they are fearfully and wonderfully made because you're their maker. That every one of their days has been ordained by you and is written in your book, not least this day. So please, God, would you speak to us by your Holy Spirit now. Point us to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and help us to live for him. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, a number of weeks ago, in a week's worth of our daily services, we looked at the first of the five of the Ten Commandments. And this week, we're looking at the last five today, taking up the Sixth Commandment. Let's say it aloud together as it comes up on the screen. You shall not murder. One of the shortest of the Ten Commandments, just two words in the original Hebrew, uh, no killing, literally, or don't kill. But what kind of killing is in view here? If we take in the context of the rest of the book of Exodus, it's clearly not speaking about the killing of an animal. Also, if we take in the wider context, it's clearly not talking about uh, the sad uh, need to take another human life within the context of a just war in order to avert further losses of human life. It's it's not talking about the need to defend oneself as someone seeks to take one's own or one's family's one's family's life. It's not take, talking about that. So what is it speaking of? Well, I think the English translation murder is a good one. And of course, a premeditated murder would be in view. Um, a voluntary manslaughter would also be in view in this commandment here where there was no premeditation, but as a result of some fit of anger, one person intentionally takes the life of another. That's in view. Also, involuntary manslaughter, if you take in the wider context, is also in view in the Sixth Commandment, where there was no uh, premeditation. There's uh, not even a, a fit of rage that leads to an intentional taking of another's life. But there's just a culpable carelessness that leads to the loss of human life. That's also in view here. Do not murder. Maybe of all the Ten Commandments, it might feel the most distant to us, the least applicable, maybe, is it? Well, in response to that question, I have us first think about our culture and also about our hearts. First, our culture. Pope John Paul II said that increasingly in our Western societies, we're living within a culture of death. Did you know that um, the average primary school student, by the time they reach the end of primary school, will have seen 8,000, on average, uh, televised deaths, either in an entertainment context or a video game or, or something akin? Are we aware that there's a small but influential group of thinkers who would have us believe that protecting the life of the disabled, uh, the unborn, 
uh, the, the prematurely born, um, the elderly, uh, uh, the otherwise incapacitated, is, is, is probably a waste of our, our resources that could be stewarded elsewhere. One medical professor writes chillingly, we can no longer base our ethics on the idea that human beings are a special form of creation made in the image of God, singled out from all other animals, and alone possessing an immortal soul. Once this religious mumbo-jumbo has been stripped away, we may continue to see normal members, note those words, normal members of our species as possessing greater capacities of rationality and self-consciousness, communication, etc., than members of other species, but we will not regard as sacro sacrosanct the life of each and every member of our species, this particular thinker says. What does happen when we strip away the Christian foundations of our society. My mom is sadly very mentally ill. She's been so as long as I can remember. I may have told you before. She's been institutionalized for over 15 years. I try and call her as often as I can, but it's very rare that I'll be able to have one or two sentences of coherent connection with her because of all the, the things that she's saying, which often seem to have no bearing in reality. Is my mom's life safe under this view? If we could have done a test while she was in her mother's womb and could have medically foreseen the, the clear defect in her brain that's led to this tragic uh, mental illness that she has, would, would they have us believe that we would have been justified to, to end her life there? According to Psalm 139, wonderfully, my grandmother's womb while my mom was there was the, was the weaving room of God. God forbid that we would have entered and cut that thread, torn down that weaving rack, or removed that loom. God forbid, not our place. Well, what about as she pivots past 65 into the last quarter or the last third? Of her life. Did you know that someone who lives to the age of 80 will have breathed close to 700 million breaths as she nears her end? Would I be justified? Would other members of my family be justified? Would my mom be justified in, in, in putting, a, putting a hand over those last breaths? God forbid. Thou shalt not murder. And these are personal issues, they're complex issues. And if you'd like to uh, wrestle with them further, there's a link in the description below where you can find some resources written uh, by our rector and other members of our ministry team that deal with um, the tough issues of abortion and assisted suicide. Do check those out. And if they're profound personal issues for you, don't hesitate to write to our office and ask to speak to a member of our ministry team. We'd love to pray for you and support you Personally, we think it's a loving thing to uphold God's word and try and spell out what it means today, first of all, in our culture, but also in our hearts. Jesus, as his uh, ministry influence increased, uh, saw an increasing number of people gather to him, and as he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, we're told in Matthew chapter 5, and he began to teach his disciples. And he said, at one point, you can see in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, you have heard that it was said, do not murder. But I tell you that any one of you who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to his brother, raka, which means empty-headed one, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and then remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of God's altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift to God, Jesus taught. So he sees the heart of murder in anger and sees it in each of us. And if we're to follow him, we must forsake that way. A friend recently told me of no less than three middle-aged women in her life, each of whom are being forsaken 
by the husband of their youth, who said to them something akin to, well, we've spent all these years together and I've been living for you and for the children and now it's time for me. And so I'm going to depart from you. And our culture hears that and says, well, to each uh, their own. Jesus sees bullets splaying out in those words and tearing through flesh. He sees the damage done by anger. He sees the murderous intent behind such angry words and would have us repent, would have us care deeply for each and every human life and to guard it and to protect it, including our own. All of us um, before can't, st can't stand underneath this commandment uh, apart from Jesus Christ. Thankfully, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all at the cross. And so let's come to him now in confession as we begin a time of prayer. Aloud together, our Father in heaven, we have sinned against you. We have disobeyed and ignored you. Please forgive us the wrongs we have done for being selfish and greedy, for bad temper and angry words we are sorry, for hurting others, for lies we have told, for things we have stolen, for the wrong in our hearts we are sorry, for not trying to please you, for not helping others we are sorry. Please forgive us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sin. Help us to live lives which please you. Amen. And finally, a prayer for justice. Would you join in with me? Loving God, you have made all people in your image, and you care for the poor and distressed. Make us a just society, where the rights of all are acknowledged and upheld, where those who are oppressed and made free, and where corruption has no place. Give companies, social institutions, and governments the desire to act for the good of all, rather than for the advantage of a few. Empower Christians to model the values of your kingdom in all their relationships. Hasten the day when Jesus will return to establish justice and your eternal reign for the glory of your name. Amen. Well, let's sing together of God's grace, which we all Shades of God, I've been set free. 
Well, again, I'm so glad that you've joined. Let's close our service with the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.